We went on to start Internode and then sold it to IONet two years ago in 2011. At that time, revenue was 180 million and had just under 200,000 customers. Simon tonight is going to talk about his journey and some of the lessons learned. Thank you. Well, it's really exciting to see this many people here and that are going to try and, and find their own way down a startup journey. Um, you know, back in back in 1991, um, somebody that, that looked vaguely like me, only he was thinner and had a lot more hair, <laughs> started a company called Internode. And yeah, I just do want to spend a few minutes talking about that experience, and but also really just trying to give you a few things to think about, almost some philosophical things to think about in the process of the journey beyond this beyond this weekend. If you've started something this weekend and you want to take it forward as a business, I just want to share with you some things that have occurred to me over time that have been useful towards the success that I ultimately had. Um, but I will underscore what, what Alan said. You know, the thing about this realm is failure is an option. You know, this is the place where this is, where this is the case. I'll also say that, that the younger you are when you, when you start, the better. As we get older, as we build up other things in our lives, you know, families, debts, mortgages, whatever, then failure gets a little bit more of a frisson to it if, it if it actually occurs. When I started Inno, I started it, um, and much as Alan said, I started it to do one thing, and three years later, um, I realised that wasn't actually that wasn't actually doing what I wanted to do, and I took I, I took a different direction, made some money doing that. That thing um, made me some money, but it was about to die as a source of income. So I took all the money I'd made and threw it into becoming an internet service provider. You know went all in again because you might as well. It's one of the benefits of being young. If you believe in that thing, then get on and do it. It might just work that way. Also, clearly, I, as, along, as, as with many of you in this room, have this particular gene, the entrepreneur gene, and it seems to be a particular sort of affectation that some of us have. I kind of always wanted to start a company. I worked here at Adelaide Uni after I graduated from Adelaide Uni, but I wanted to start a company. I didn't know why. It was just kind of like this, this condition, mental condition I had must start a company, must start a company. I want to talk a little bit about what you do once you have got out past this weekend and it works. Whatever it is that got that startup going that you begin on doing, you will hopefully find something you're really good at, something you're really passionate at. There's an awful lot about growing a business that involves other things that you aren't passionate about, things that need to happen, you know, like charging things and getting paid and running, doing the books and all that boring stuff. If you find yourself doing a lot of that stuff and it's boring and silly, outsource it. You know, get someone else to do it, hire someone to do it, delegate it. Focus yourself on what you think makes you great at doing that thing because that's where the value is, is the piece that you bring to the table. Outsource and otherwise move away all the other boring stuff. It's, not, it's boring to you, but there are people who find passion in doing those other things. So bring them into the process, right? Success in this realm is absolutely a team game. You can grow slowly and succeed, to, to borrow, uh, borrow what we've already heard. It does work. You can build up a head of steam later. There's nothing illegal, immoral, or fattening about that. It can actually be done that way. And I ran a business in a very boring, slow way as a result initially. I grew up in the era of very high interest rates, so I was averse to debt, so I just didn't take any. You know, there are lots of ways to do this, but, but the, the high debt, run, run, run thing is only one of them. Multiple paths to success here. And really, the Clue Train Manifesto is where what's become social media began. Back in around 1999, when my business was seven or eight years old, um, somebody wrote a book called The Clue Train Manifesto. It's still on the internet. You can go to cluetrain.com and, and, and read the book and read the sort of about 100 little haikus about what that means. But really, the core, the core philosophy about the Clue Train Manifesto is three words. Markets are conversations. And it's really a thing to meditate on. Markets are conversations. It's what social media seems to make obvious. But you have to believe that the market you're in is a virtuous circle with the conversation your customers have about it. It's not a little part of the problem, it's all of it. It's why people buy your stuff. Because you have a conversation with them about your passion and about why your passion has led you to make something so cool they should actually pay for it. I started in a note without money as the aim. Right? The passion was the aim, the money was just the fuel in the engine to turn the thing over, to let me keep doing things that seem cool to me. It, that needs to be what empowers you. The money will follow along automatically. That's the thing to bear in mind. It really is, the, from my point of view, the little secret codex that describes what we now call social media, why it works and how to do it. And really what it devolves to is this experience we've all had reading press releases from large corporate organisations. We've all had the experience to read something from a large, a large multinational 
read the text and your immediate mental reaction is bullshit. <laughs> you know, like whatever you just wrote, it's just bullshit. You don't believe that. You wrote it because that's what you think somebody, your investment community required you to write. Write the truth, turn up in social media in your own name, in your own voice. That authenticity and that involvement with your own customer base is what powers you to become your own brand to make that thing work. Innanode became incredibly successful doing almost no advertising because I decided to turn up in the social media of my sector, Whirlpool, and just be involved, talk to my own customers, have conversations with them, and discuss the failures in our business in public, in web forums. Because when people call you out in social media and say, you got that wrong, they're not doing it to embarrass you, they're doing, you, doing it just because they want you to fix it. If you fix it, if you create that public virtuous circle, everybody wins and everybody likes the idea of buying that thing you did and it might just succeed. So the fundamental point then, when you're out in the world with your startup and it's starting to happen and you're interacting with your own customers, tell the truth, be authentic, don't bullshit them and it might do extremely well and it certainly did do well for me. Thank you.